Good morning, everyone, and happy Tuesday. I hope you all have your coffee in hands, preferably Cuban coffee. My name is Maria Carla Chicuen, and I am the Executive Director of Casa Cuba at FIU. I would like to thank you all for joining us for a truly special event. This morning, Casa Cuba is proud to partner with the FIU College of Law and the Cuban American Bar Association, CABA, to inaugurate a lecture series that seeks to highlight the personal stories and professional experiences of prominent Cuban lawyers in our community. For this inaugural event, we are proud to host our first featured speaker, Cesar Alvarez, Senior Chairman of Greenberg Torig. Cesar is also a founding member of the Casa Cuba Board of Advisors and a trustee of FIU. He will be in conversation with Maria Garcia, immediate past president of CABA, and one of our shiniest stars in FIU's distinguished alumni community. Before we begin, I would like to share a bit about Casa Cuba. Casa Cuba is a historic initiative of FIU to develop a leading cultural center and think tank for the study of Cuban affairs and the celebration and preservation of our Cuban heritage. Casa Cuba will be a place to commemorate Cuba's rich history, arts, and culture, a global forum for business leaders policymakers, artists, and experts to address the urgent issues that Cubans face today. And somewhere we can proudly take our family and friends and show them our roots. Our future iconic facility will be built right at the entrance of the main FIU campus. And it will feature galleries for inter interactive exhibits, classrooms to teach FIU's more than 70 courses on Cuba, and a state-of-the-art venue for events, artistic performances, and dynamic programs such as today's event. FIU has recently selected Rene Gonzalez Architects to design our building and renderings will soon be released to share our exciting vision with the world. This new series represents Casa Cuba's vision to connect the past, the present, and the future of Cuba and the Cuban community from around the world. Cubans have achieved exceptional success in the practice of law in South Florida and beyond, and we are proud to welcome these leaders for intimate conversations on their Cuban roots and family story, their inspiring ascent to their present success and their take on the evolution of the legal industry, including the future representation of Cubans and Latinos at large in the field. I would like to thank Cesar and Maria, two extraordinary leaders for coming together in conversation this morning and for their longstanding support of our FIU. Thank you also to our friends and partners at the FIU College of Law, CABA and Greenberg Trorig, and especially to Dean Anthony Page, Jasmine Grant, Lily Space and Maite Morales for their hard work to coordinate this event. And thank you all for tuning in. I hope to see you at future events in this series and invite you to get involved in the once in a lifetime effort to build our Casa Cuba. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Anthony Page, Dean of the FIU College of Law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome. Thank you all for being here at this event put on by Casa Cuba, the Cuban American Bar Association, and FIU Law. Now, uh, FIU Law, we are still a very young law school, having graduated our first class only 15 years ago. In that time, however, our graduates have been very successful. You probably already know about our bar success. Number one, again, in the most recent Florida bar and number one in eight of the last 11 bar exams. But actually, our graduates do even better than that. The ABA in February did a study where they adjusted based on the difficulty that each graduate, the difficulty of the bar exam that each graduate was taking. And then they ranked all the schools based on their graduate performance. And FIU Law came in there, not just first in Florida, but second overall across the entire United States. Even more important than the bar, however, is our graduates' employment success. And based on the data from the most recent class, and depending on how you rank different kinds of jobs, we're either first, second, or third among Florida's 12 law schools. Now, I tell you this in part, because our speaker today, Cesar Alvarez, was instrumental in getting this law school founded in the first place. Moreover, he recently agreed to chair our 
uh, reformed Dean's Leadership Council. So uh, thank you very much for all of that. I also mention this because our moderator, Maria Garcia, is an FIU law graduate. Actually, she's a double panther, earning a BA at FIU as well. Now, Maria is a partner and co-chair of the health practice at Koziak, Tropin, and Falk Martin, where she focuses in particular on healthcare law. And uh, I, I hope Maria will forgive me if I mention I, I often use Maria as an example with students and graduates, and as an example that you don't have to love your first practice area. Maria actually started after graduating with a year in maritime law before deciding that wasn't really your favorite and switching to health law, which she loves. So um, thank you, Maria, for serving in as an example to these students and graduates. Maria has been named a top lawyer in healthcare in the South Florida Legal Guide several times. Super Lawyer Magazine named her a rising star in 2020. She was named by Florida Trend Magazine as one of the 500 most influential business leaders in Florida. She's also served as the president of the Cuban American Bar Association in 2019. And she also served as president of FIU's Alumni Association. I should also add that I'm personally very pleased that she has accepted an invitation to serve on our law school's Dean's Leadership Council. So as you can all see, we're all very, very proud of Maria Garcia and absolutely delighted to count her as one of our graduates. Thank you. We're also very pleased that you've agreed to moderate this event today. And at this point, let me turn it over to Maria Garcia. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. And thank you to Dean Page for those warm words. Uh, thank you also to Maria Carla and Jasmine Grant and Cesar Alvarez for doing this event this morning. It's really, I think as a Gaba's immediate past president, it's, it's an honor for Gaba to be partnering with FIU Law and with Casa Cuba on this event and this series, because it, it really does bring a lot of different players in the Cuban community, the Cuban American community together. And it truly is important that we share our stories, stories like Caesar's about his, you know, his challenges and his successes and all the wonderful things he's done in the legal community and our legal and our community at large. So I think this is a perfect way to start this program. And as an alumni, as Dean Page mentioned, I see FIU, Cuba, uh, Gawa and Casa Cuba coming together like a family. And I think we have so much that we could do together. So this is an, a wonderful way to start that process. And I really look forward to sharing today with all of you and, and having a great discussion with Caesar. And if once we start the program, if you have any questions, there's a Q&A box. You could go ahead and put your, your comments there. We'll have a little Q&A session at the end so that you, know, you guys can get some of your questions in as well. I think we're gonna have a great panel. We have a lot of people on, on the webinar so we're really looking forward to getting, getting this started. Um, as I mentioned, as a past president of Kawa, as a daughter of Cuban exiles and of a, a political prisoner, this is truly an honor um, to be doing this, this talk today with Caesar and with all of you. And you know, let's just get started and have a, a great hour. So before we get into the questions for Caesar, I'm gonna go ahead and give a very brief um, summary of his amazing career and life, and then we'll just jump right into it. So Cesar Alvarez, as Maria Carla mentioned, is past CEO and current senior chairman of Greenberg Torig. During his 15 year tenure as CEO and executive chairman, he led the firm to become one of the top 10 law firms in the US by leading its growth from 325 lawyers in eight offices to approximately 1,850 attorneys in more than 36 locations in the US and around, around the world, including strategic alliances in Milan and Rome, um, under Caesar's leadership and with the support of his partners, the firm was recognized as the fastest growing law firm in the United States. A little bit about his background. At the age of 13, Caesar immigrated from Cuba with his family to escape communism. After graduating from the University of Florida with a Bachelor of Science, Master's of Business Administration, and a Juris Doctor, he joined Greenberg Torig as its ninth lawyer. Before taking helm as CEO, Caesar practiced securities, corporate and international law for more than 25 years. 
Throughout his career, he has represented numerous public companies and currently serves on the board of directors of several publicly traded corporations, private companies, and charitable organizations. He has been recognized nationally and in his community for his professional business and charitable leadership. Most recently, Caesar was honored with the American Lawyer Media 2018 Lifetime Achievement Award, Ernst and Young 2017 Entrepreneur Lifetime Achievement Award, Chambers and Partners Lifetime Achievement Award, the ABA Spirit of Excellence Award, and the Hispanic National Bar Foundation Lifetime Achievement Award. So as we could see, Caesar is extremely accomplished and an honor for the Cuban and Cuban American community. And it's, it's great to be here with him today. So we're just gonna jump into some questions we have for Caesar again. At the end, if you have any questions, put those in the Q&A uh, chat box and we'll try to get to, to those as well. So Caesar, to get started, um, I think we could start with your history as when you came to the US and then move into your legal career and also some advice for law students and young lawyers, who I think we have quite a few on today. So just to get started, if you could tell us a little bit about your journey to the US, how you got here and what have been uh, the biggest challenges professionally and personally for you as someone who came to the US and has succeeded to this day. Thank you, Maria, and uh, I'd like to thank everybody that has already been thanked. I won't go through the list, but we can get right into the questions, but I'm, uh, uh, I'll repeat the, the same thanks that were given. Um, you know, when I, uh, when I do anything in life, uh, any meeting, any thing that I undertake, I, I, I first try to define what winning is, what, what would winning be. So for me, there is a winning in doing this program. And the winning for me is, is passing a pool, is, is, is doing what other people had done for me and hopefully trying to do that for somebody who's on the line today. So if 20 years from now, somebody who's on the line today was motivated to be on a board of directors or was motivated to, to get into a leadership position, if, if just one of you do that, I would consider this a, a big win. And I hope there'll be a lot more than that, but that's my, my goal. My journey to the, to the US was a very difficult, Maria, of, of so many, so many of us who live in Miami today and, and are part of the exile community. Um, my, uh, uh, I migrated here at, at, on June 28th of 1960. Um, as you know, when, in those days, when you were trying to leave Cuba, you, you, your parents couldn't tell you you were going to leave Cuba because you could let it out. And if you let it out and people knew you were going to leave, it would make life very difficult for you. So I did not know we were leaving to the, the US. Uh, there used to be a ferry that went from Havana to Key West. And the reason people would take that ferry is because you could take your auto that would be the only possession that you landed in the United States with, but at least you have something to drive around. So we, we took uh, the ferry. Uh, I was awakened, uh, in fact, it was a Tuesday morning, as, as I still remember it, and well, I was told we were going on a vacation to the US. And I found it very strange that I was wearing a lot of gold medals and, and gold things that I had in my pocket, et cetera, and knew quite the understand what we needed that including some silverware. And I, I thought that the United States was a fairly civilized country and they actually they have their own silverware, but uh, we brought it anyhow. And, um, and we took the ferry. And as I remember, um, we were playing on the top of the ferry. I had, there's four, four kids in our family and all four of which were running around on top of the ferry. I was 13 years old uh, at the time. And I look back and I see my mother and father looking back from Havana Harbor towards El Malecón, which is a beautiful, beautiful sight. And they're crying. And I say to myself, I didn't know, I said, this is going to be a hell of a vacation. They're already fighting. And, uh, you know, what's going to happen here? Uh, because they, they couldn't tell me. And, and it wasn't until we landed in the U.S. that my parents uh, told us what had happened and what would happen. And my father uh, did something that was very strange at the time. He moved us 
1960 to North Miami. Um, North Miami in 1960, there was not a Cuban within a 10 mile radius of what I grew up. And he did that very intentionally. Uh, he did it because he wanted us to, to assimilate to the new, new world. And, uh, and we did, and I, you know, I remember X number of months that I was going to school, didn't understand much of what's going on. I was crying, I wanted to go back to Cuba. I wanted to, to see my little girlfriend that I left behind. And, you know, my kids said, well, why didn't you text her? Uh, <laughs> I said, well, you know, I don't think you could text her at, at, at the time. Um, th those were very, very, very hard and difficult times. But I went to North Miami High where there were 5,000 students. There was, out of the 5,000 students, there were two Cubans, myself, and some other fellow and a black student. That was it, that was it. And, and about half of the kids were Jewish Americans, uh, but the other half were the typical Irish American, German American, that kind of blend, et cetera. And I had to assimilate. I had to figure out how to get it done. And that immersion, that there, there was no plan B, there was only plan A, uh, was really what motivated all my life because I have never thought that I could fail at anything because I didn't have the margin to do that. I didn't have somebody that could possibly give me, my parents would have given me anything they had. They just didn't have it. <laughs> and, and so you live with that and you live with that. With, with that tenacity, and I, and really, my my Cuban parents, the thing that they instill in our head so much was, if somebody else has done it, you can do it. If somebody else has done it, you can do it. So whenever I was, you know, having issues, etc., they say, "Has anybody else done it?" <laughs> and if I said yes, he says, "Well, then you can do it." Um, and so. That was a pretty, pretty big uh, motivator for, uh, for me. I also happened to have uh, a, 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 a very, uh, it was very well known at the time. I, I have a brother, Carlos, who was an all American, he was the first all American player in football. And I don't, I don't know how long, I mean, I agree. It was, uh, and he was the first Cuban to actually make it in the United States on something at that scale, where he was a consensus All-American. He had every honor that you can imagine, et cetera. Um, and that was a good, uh, good thing. So I, I have always seen uh, and been around that Cuban success, the Cuban success of, we don't have plan B, we're making it, we're making it, we're making it. And that, uh, that positive attitude, even though I have had hundreds of failures, but the fact that your parents expected you to get up, dust yourself, stop feeling sorry for yourself, and move forward uh, has stayed with me all my life. And I think if I were to say what was an experience of, 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 of being a Cuban exile, that was it. And, and the other part of that is that I feel very strongly, and I've said this many, many times, that my parents' generation that brought us here is the greatest Cuban generation ever. What they did for us, how they sacrificed their life entirely, they worked menial jobs, they did whatever they had to do because they wanted us to be educated and do better. And the sacrifice that that generation has done, we can never forget. We cannot forget. I think nowadays, you know, is uh, uh, I hear some people saying, well, you know, they were too radical and they, they were too extreme and there was this and there was that. They were not too radical and too extreme. They had everything taken away from them. They came here, they did whatever they had to do to make us successful. So if we're here, we're here, we owe it to, to that generation. 
And that generation is coming to an end. And I think I would urge everybody, if you have a, like a grandfather or somebody of that age, go say thanks to them. They will really appreciate it. Yeah, and, and Caesar, I think that, you know, that reflects what so many, you know, families came to this country and, and lived through. And, and I completely agree with you that I think that, you know, we are taught, I, I was born here, but my parents obviously came from Cuba and they always taught me, you know, failure is not an option. You're in this country, you have great opportunity and you could go as high as you want to and that there isn't a plan B, you know, like when you came over, like you were saying there, you were, it, it, your parents, it was obvious they were not going back, right? You know, they, you, you remember that so vividly that they were crying on the ferry. I cannot Im imagine that experience, right? Of leaving everything, especially as an adult, you know, where now you, you thought you had all this and it's gone. Um, so I think that that's a really touching story and, and it's such an experience that I imagine shaped you. Um, so much. And, and I think that now when we talk a little bit about your career and what you've done in the law, um, if you could start off by saying these lessons that you learned from your parents, which one would you say, and you've talked about so many, but what would you say is the, the leading one that has influenced you as an attorney and as a leader in our legal community? Which one would that be? If you had one single one you could tell the audience about? Well, my, uh, I saw leadership from my parents. And the leadership that I saw in my parents was servant leadership. It was not autocratic leadership. It was not, I'm the boss and you're not leadership. Uh, it was leadership that the way that you led is by serving the group that you were serving and, and, and never thinking of yourself as the boss or the CEO or anything to that level. And so that's how I applied my life. I, I think if you talk to people at Greenberg Courage, they would tell you that I always say, I work for you guys. That's my job is to work for you guys. It's not the other way around. And, um, and all my assistants I ever had, I have made it a point to, to let them know, because this is something that can happen to your life, is that your assistant needs to reflect your personality, not their personality. And many times that happens. And so, you know, an assistant can be short where your partners can do, and, and what do they think? They think it's coming from you. <laughs> so my assistants know that if any partner anywhere in the world calls and says he needs me and needs to interrupt me, that they're to interrupt me. If the partner says she needs me, yeah. now, the truth of the matter is I've been interrupted twice uh, because she will say, look, he can talk to you in an hour, but if you want me to interrupt him, I will. Again, these are small things, but these are the things that tell people that you believe in a leadership approach, which is to motivate them to get to the next level, to, to reach that that improbable goal that people think that you cannot achieve. And I can tell you that at, at, uh, at, at Greenberg Park, when we were growing, uh, I would tell you that when we were in Miami and we wanted to go to Fort Lauderdale, everybody said, well, you know, you guys did well in Miami, but you're going to fail in Fort Lauderdale. But in Fort Lauderdale, that's all the people who left that didn't want to be in Miami and you're going to fail. And so we went to Fort Lauderdale and we didn't fail. And then then we went to Palm Beach, and again, we had all the consultants tell you that you were going to fail. And so uh, I have been told all my life what I cannot do, <laughs> what we cannot do, what, and, and all very good reasons why you cannot do it. They all sound damn logical at the time. But as I say, our, our success has been mostly because we were too dumb to understand good advice. We just plowed through and, and made it. And, and I remember when we were going to Tallahassee, I said, oh my God, Tallahassee, are you kidding? People have guns over there. They, you know, they, he's never gonna make it in Tallahassee. And so step, step by step, we overcame the odds. And there is no greater pleasure in life to do what people tell you you cannot do. 
yeah. it is the best. <laughs> uh, and 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 I think with with a servant leadership style that motivates people as opposed to making scare of you, it allows you to bring out the best of them. And I don't care how good you are, you're not as good as 2200 lawyers. You're just not. <laughs> so you need to bring those 2200 lawyers to bring out the best of them. And that's your job. Your job is not to have the great ideas. You know, I used to say, look, I, I didn't want any great idea from any senior manager because you know that's not what the great ideas are becoming. The great ideas are becoming at the lawyers who are working, who are dealing with clients, who know what's going on. That's where the great idea is. You don't want some bureaucratic person who's never done anything to look at a uh, you know at a uh, at, at an article somewhere and decide that this is the way it's it's go, it, it's going to go. It's like when we had 40 some offices, I was just the people, how silly can you be to think that today you wake up and say, well, today I'm gonna to fix New York. I know exactly what to do in New York, et cetera. And tomorrow I'll do Chicago and then I'll do LA, et cetera. It's silly when you put it that way, but there's a lot of firms that do that. There's a lot of people who do that. When my partner from Chicago said, well, what should you do? I said, what are you asking me? I'm not in Chicago, you're in Chicago. If you need help with resources, et cetera, that, that's what I'm there for. But I'm not there to tell you what to do in Chicago. You are the person there. So by, by delegating and truly delegating and understanding that sometimes people are not going to do it the way you do it. And sometimes they're going to make some mistakes, et cetera, but they're going to grow and they're going to take you from for the servant leadership that you're providing. And so to me, learning that from my parents have been very helpful because that, that's my style of leadership and I have used that my, my entire life and, um, and has worked out uh, fairly well for me. Yeah, I think that that's a, a great way to look at it. You know, everybody has skin in the game and feels empowered to be a part of the organization and be part of, of, your, of your firm. Um, and I think that's really important. And, you know, I think, so now you've been at Greenberg for about 45 years and, you know, we talked a little bit and it's of course an undertone here that you are one, a great leader at your law firm and the things you've done are really unprecedented. And when you were starting off as a younger lawyer at GT, did you think you would get to this role of being CEO, now a senior chairman? Was that something you were looking at at the time or did it more happen to you as your career developed? When I started on a Monday, I didn't think I was going to make it to, to, to Tuesday. <laughs> that, uh, and, and, and I am not kidding to you about this. I started in 1973. I was making $11,500. And every day I would come in and I knew that that day they were going to fire me because there was nothing, nothing that I could imagine in my mind that I could do that was worth $11,500 a year. So every day, it was a survival. And so to tell you the truth, every day in my life is survival. And, and it's still today, it, it is survival. And it's not about dreams. It's, 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 it's very interesting. I was at a, at a dinner not, not long ago with, um, Don Francisco, Mario Korsberger, and he had like about 10, 12 people around the table and he likes to engage in conversation about different things. And the conversation was about dreams. What, what are your dreams? What did you dream about? You know, what, what, what are you trying to achieve? And I found it very curious. There were four Cubans in that group. And I have never discussed this with anybody else. And all four of us had the same concept of dreams. We didn't dream. We survived day by day by day. And we moved into bigger things and bigger things that we never dreamed because everything was taken away from us from one day to the other. And that was just not a, a good concept. Now, so, so to me, um, it's not about dreaming. And by the way, I, I, 
I give a lot of speeches to people about dreaming and making it forward, but but to myself, find it almost impossible to dream. I just survived that day, and and of course it's it's moving in a direction. You know, you're surviving every day, and you're moving in a direction, and and you're achieving and achieving more, etc. But I did it by doing the best job I could on a day by day basis and one added to the next and to the next and to the next. And then I, whatever got, whatever I did and whatever I did, uh, et cetera, th there was nothing because again, my exile experience that I started out and say, you know, 10 years from now, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Leaving Cuba and having everything separated from you from one day really, really, um, limits your ability to dream on long-term basis. And I generally don't discuss this, but that is really the reality of it for me. Mm -hmm. And so you think as you're, now that you talked a little about, so you saw it as surviving, not necessarily dreaming, but that that philosophy got you to where you are yes. and you've risen to a, you know, an amazing level of success. And do you think that now as a leader at your firm, as someone that I'm sure young associates, young partners, a lot of people look up to at the law firm and wonder and think, okay, how did he do this? How could I do something like that? Do you think that, are you an agent now for showing people how to dream? Even though that wasn't your own personal philosophy, right? Because of the experience as an immigrant, but do you see yourself, I am now someone who leads by example and I could show others the way to dreaming in their lives and making those goals a reality. I did, and, and I do, and 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 we didn't get to go from a couple hundred lawyers to, to to a couple thousand lawyers without dreaming. I saw people their dreams. I sold them the fact that they should dream, mm -hmm. and they should not be limited by anyone on what they can dream about. And that's another great concept: is that the people that would limit you the most in life are the people closest to you. And this is an interesting concept to, to think about it, but think about it for a second. If you go to your parents, they say, you know, I'd like to be the CEO of General Motors. They're gonna say, well, you know, I want to hurt, hurt you. You know, you shouldn't really be dreaming that big. Maybe, maybe you can be to a smaller corporation. Maybe you can do this, maybe you can do that. Because they don't want you to be hurt. Because success, there is a lot of hurts along the way to success. It's a lot of times you're gonna you're gonna fall down and you're gonna have to get up and dust yourself. Our parents, my parents, didn't view it that way. <laughs> to them, was somebody can do it, you can do it, and if you got to get up ten times, you get up ten times. They were not concerned that I was going to scrape my knees or my elbows and I was going to cry and I wasn't going to do that. That was not what was going on. So I always say to people, don't let anybody limit you. You got to dream as big as you can possibly dream. And if you can dream it and if you can visualize it, you can get there. I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm not telling you that there are going to be some issues along the way but you can get there. So yes, I am very, very big in, 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 in advocating for dreaming, even though, even though, as I'm telling you personally, I myself, I'm much more limited. I got around to it. I, I always say I got around to it, but not everybody has the, the, the experience that everything was taken away from them from one day to the other. And so, so, so the ability to dream is different. The biggest problem with dreams today is that people who are closest to you who are going to take it away from you. <laughs> and you're going to say, no, Maria, you know, you have to stay in, 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 in maritime law because you can't be a healthcare lawyer. And you're saying, I don't care what anybody, says. I'm going to be a healthcare lawyer and I'm going to do whatever it takes to do. And I am sure. That was not an easy transition. You know, you have to learn a whole new area and, 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 and you got people who were already ahead of you because they already been doing that, et cetera. But you somehow, somehow, you said, I'm gonna do it. And I'm sure there was someone, I can almost count on it, trying to talk you out of it. 
<laughs> and try to say maybe this is not a good idea. You know, maybe you have a pretty good practice here. Maybe don't do that. Maybe don't do the other thing. And 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 you overcame all that. Yeah, you know, you know, it was, um, you know, after one year of maritime, I think sometimes in the, in the law it becomes important what you know you don't like, right? So right. after ten years, you know, now being a healthcare lawyer for ten years. The, it just felt, you know, like kind of like you were saying, you're surviving, right? You're not even thinking about it sometimes. You just say, this is what I'm going to do because it's what I, I feel is the way for me, right? In my life and professionally, that's how I felt years ago. Um, and when you talk a little bit about the, that success is a road paved with challenges, right? Challenges, hard work, probably going to get disappointed sometimes. And that's why people sometimes who love you limit you, right? They don't want you to feel hurt. Um, now, as after your long career at, at GT, that continues to this day, um, what are some of the lessons you've learned, right, on the, on the road to success? What are some of those lessons you could give to young uh, law, law students, to young partners, young associates? What are some of those lessons you've learned on that way to success? The, probably the biggest lesson I learned is a quote that I often use when I'm trying to motivate my partners, etc. that the road to success is dotted with a lot of comfortable parking spaces because that's the next thing that happens to you. You become a little bit successful and you say, hey, this is a pretty good parking space here. <laughs> I'm gonna pull in and try to take some of the pressure to myself. And if you pull into any of those parking places, you will not be the success that you can be. You gotta let those comfortable parking spaces go by and challenge yourself again and again and again, and again on a survival and a dream or whatever it is, but you got to keep challenging yourself. They will be comfortable parking space. You will uh, feel like taking it and you have to have the fortitude to say, no, I can actually do better <laughs> than that. I, I, I can get to the next comfortable parking space. And when I get to that one, I'm going to get to the one after that. And I think people who are pretty successful are never quite satisfied with what they are. They, they don't know how to take the comfortable parking spaces. If you knew how to take the comfortable parking spaces, you would not achieve at those levels. That has been a very clear lesson, you know, in my life, along with not letting anybody limit you. Uh, don't let anybody limit you. And 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 uh, and so anyway, we're ready to discuss that. But to me, that that was a great lesson uh, in life is is to keep going to the comfortable parking spaces. Look, I, I at one time I was you know I used to work incredible hours uh, you know, uh, and I remember my 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 lifelong partner. Matt Gorson, who's a great real estate lawyer, and, and we've been partners for almost 50 years. You know, my generation, and certainly the Cuban generation, to me, we would trade whatever amount of time we had for money. That, that trade you would do every day. So Mel Greenberg was a great motivator. You were already working like, you know, 2,500 hours, and he would say, by the way, if you work 2,700 hours, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an extra thousand dollars at the end of the year, and I would sign up for that immediately. <laughs> and and Matt used to say, "Don't you have a calculator? You, do you understand how much that is an hour? You're not getting anything. I mean, I mean you're stupid." <laughs> And I said, Matt, you don't understand. I said, I'm not working for the money. I'm working for the experience. I'm working because I want to make myself the best lawyer that I can. And the only way, the only way you're going to become a great lawyer, mm -hmm. it's not by just reading books. It's by doing transactions, by doing negotiations, by being in litigation, by doing. I always thought law in itself is not difficult. But the time commitment that it requires is huge. So for you to be successful, you need a major time commitment. And what I saw was the opportunity, not what they were paying me at the time, because really I was looking, which in my generation was easier to do, I was looking 10, 15 years down the line. 
not whatever I was going to get paid that, that year. It, it was almost immaterial to me. And, and Mel Greenberg was a, um, you know, I, he used to say that we wanted to have very insecure lawyers that were motivated by money uh, and, because that provided the greatest number of, of hours. And, and I was the perfect candidate uh, for that. I was insecure and I, uh, I was motivated, uh, motivated by money. And so he always used to try to push it with the money. And so what I used to do to play around with his mind I was always had a plan, a, a, a plan of what would happen if I, I couldn't make the money. So I remember we used to get 50% of our compensation was in a salary and 50% of our compensation was in bonuses. I used to live on 50% of my compensation. So I saved 25 of my organization, not to mention the bonuses. So what I used to do to drive him nuts, I wouldn't cash my paychecks. So I would have like six months of paychecks. So I just want to let them know that I didn't need the money. <laughs> that was my, 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 and he would send the bookkeeper in to say, hey, you, you got to catch a check. You got to do that. But I knew that he knew that I didn't know I, I didn't I really need that check. And, and so that's how I, uh, I, 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 I play a little chess with, uh, with Mel. Yeah, putting some some bad debt on the on the books. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, that's what, what is. well, you know, the, the, the way Mel convinced me, you know, I uh, he, he called me at the University of Florida. I was one of two law students at the time, and, and um, with my brother, so there were three of us, and my brother and I were going to come. There were maybe five Cuban lawyers that were bilingual here at the time, and, and we were going to open a little shop and get going. And we would have done great because there was nobody else, uh, you know, it was very, very few lawyers. So Mel um, called his buddy uh, uh, Glitzberg, who was my, my professor for real estate, and said, is there any Cubans there that you could recommend? Because Mel was the first lawyer in Miami who realized that the Cubans were not going back as quickly as we thought we were going back. He realized we were gonna be around. So he wanted a Cuban lawyer to begin to penetrate the business community, what, what was then developing. So he called me and I said, no, Mr. Greenberg, I'm gonna do this with my brother. He said, well, come down, I'll fly you down to Miami. I haven't been in that plane, uh, you know, ever. So I, I took a little, you know, uh, pedal pusher from Gainesville down to, uh, to, to see him because I wanna see my parents. So when I came in to meet with Mel, First of all, my, my famous football player brother's name is Carlos, and he was a big football fan. So he called me Carlos. And to this day, I believe that he hired Carlos. He didn't think it was, it was me. He, so in the interview, he'd say, hi, Carlos, how are you doing? And I'd say, you know, Mr. Greenberg, you know, my name is Caesar. He'd say, yeah, 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 and two minutes later, you know Carlos. And so we had this conversation and he said to me, um, well, how much do you think a very successful, you know, it, it, not very, he said it, it's sort of a average successful lawyer at this firm makes. And I said to myself, I know this game and I, I'm going to, I'm going to give him a number so high that he's going to have to say, well, nobody can make that much money. So I come up with a name, with a number that I thought it was impossible to get to which again, this is 1972, that number was $50,000. So I said $50,000. And Mel was a tall, lanky guy. He leans back on his chair and he starts laughing. Oh, that's what happened. He said, Caesar, if on a bad year, a most junior partner doesn't pay $50,000 in taxes, there's something really wrong. So he got my attention. <laughs> And, 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 and from then on, uh, we, you know, he, I, I joined up even though he kept calling me Carlos. And, and I think for some reason, uh, he thinks he hired Carlos. <laughs> Until <laughs> the first time he told me to play football and he realized he had hired Caesar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like I hired the wrong guy. Um, so just to move, because I know we have a few minutes left, but I wanted to get a little bit more into um, some of the, the current issues going on 
in the legal community and also our business community really at large. So there's been quite a bit of attention about diversity at law firms, diversity at corporations. And you know, you've had this great experience serving on different boards of, of companies, your experience at Greenberg. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about your thoughts on where diversity is going in the professional world, looking at, especially that we have so many law students and young lawyers on, on the line today, um, what your thoughts are on where diversity is going, uh, what you think about the efforts to have more inclusion at law firms and in corporations, and and what what do you where do you think that's going? What what are you saying? Well, I have, I have watched diversity very closely for a lot of years. So when I graduated in 1972, if you would have said to me, "What would diversity be in the year 2020?" I would have said we would have everything solved by then. Truth of the matter is, we don't have everything solved by then. I think women have done better, but not where they need to be. And for Hispanics and Blacks, uh, we are pretty much back to where we were before now. I think you have to be honest with yourself and analyze this problem. And I think most people try to gloss over and, and you can't. So, so you have to look at the Hispanic population in the United States, if you're gonna look at how many lawyers you have, but you have to do one more step in between. As a minimum, for you to be a lawyer, you at least have to have a four year degree. If you don't have a four year degree, you can't get into law school. So if you look at what percentage of the Hispanic population in the United States has a four-year education after the age of 25, you come up with a number of 14%. If you multiply 14% times the 18%, which is the percentage of the total population that the Hispanics are, that translates to 252 so now when you look at the number of Hispanics that are in law school, you got to look at that number differently. And you have to, um, if you want to solve the problem, if you want to put your head in the sand and say, no, you got it. In fact, if you, if, if you look at that number, you would say that there has been a great effort to include Hispanics because the numbers of Hispanics are actually larger than the number that you will predict just by doing some mathematical analysis. Um, and, and this is, you know, now, if you look at the black community, the black community has done a much better job than the Hispanic community in penetrating boards of directors and even penetrating law firms, et cetera. They have been more actively involved. They have gotten more involved, but unless, we increase our graduation rate from college so you can at least have a shot to get into law school. It is very difficult to say to the law firms at the end, you got to hire more Hispanic because you know what happens. They do hire more Hispanic, but it's a revolving circle. You're not increasing the total number where, you know, I, I got to Hispanic, you know, et cetera. Now, the good news is that they, I, I know this because I'm, 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 a, I'm a big law and, and, and big law has a demand for Hispanics. So there is a demand there, but we need to graduate. We need to, we need to solve our graduation problem. If you look at the Cuban community, for example, as you know, the Cuban migration, the initial Cuban migration was different than a typical migration because it was political exiles as opposed to economic migration. That's the original one in, let's say, in the first 20 years from 1960. So what you got, you got the most educated, most successful Cuban came. It wasn't a cross-section of Cuban society. It was the cream of the crop, okay? If you look at the Mexican migration, it's more of an economic migration, so people who are just trying to do better are coming to, to, to the U.S. because they want to feed their families, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so you have, 
when you look at the Hispanic community, there's a lot of different groups that have come in different ways. But take Cuban. The graduation rate for Cubans is 27%. If you take the graduation rate for Venezuelan, it's over 50%. Now, the graduation rate for Cubans in the early part of the 60s when we first came here was over 50%. But as we have began to migrate a more bell-shaped curve migration, the graduation rate has gone lower, and that predicts less lawyers <laughs> uh, than if you have 50%. If you have 50%, you're going to have more lawyers than you have 27%. So we, we really need to, to um, come with, with, a, with, a, with a plan which varies by communities within the Hispanic community. You know, the Hispanic community, we, we, they throw us in a, in, a big, in a big basket, but the history is different in different groups. It doesn't mean one better than the other. They're different, and therefore the solution to the problem needs to be different. But if, 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 if we don't educate Hispanics, at a much higher rate that we're doing, we are not going to improve on diversity. We will have a lot of seminars. We will have a lot of things. Every law firm will, will have an ad that with a baseball bat with different color hands and, 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 and do all those things. But they, we, got, we got to create lawyers because lawyers, you know, my, the reason I got involved in the FIU Law School is that I know from my practice, that lawyers have a disproportionate influence in society. Lawyers are legislators, they're judges, they're key executives in corporations, they, they, they're, 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 they're in your city commission. They're, lawyers tend to have a disproportionate amount of influence. They access society at a much high level. So my theory has always been that unless you have enough lawyers in your community, you will not be able to access society in, in, the, in the right way. That's one of the reasons I got involved with uh, at FIU. And, and one of the missions of FIU is that it's a social activism in a sense of how do we better represent our communities and we need lawyers to do that and unless unless we graduate more lawyers and get them a four-year degree we don't even have people on the race don't have people on the race and and again it is a lot easier to say everybody's discriminating against us and is doing this and is doing that and that's the reason why we don't have any any lawyers but I'm a realist, and, and, and I think we, we need to focus on that ourselves and push ourselves forward and, and try to get more people graduating. And certainly the ones that we graduate, that we can get into law school, get into law school, et cetera. But as I, if I just look at the numbers very objectively, I don't like the trends. Yeah, and so we have a few minutes left, Caesar, and I want to get one more question, and then we have two Q&A. So... Uh, the last question before we get to the Q&A, um, following up on what, what you just said, and I think that that's a very real pressure point, right? Like getting people out of, um, out of college and into law school, the graduation rate. Once you're in law school, and then once you're in the legal community and you're starting your career, what impact do you think, once you've gotten through that, that gauntlet, what impact do you think organizations like GAWA organizations like the law school you graduated from, FIU Law, which graduates a huge amount of Hispanics, relatively speaking, of, you know, compared to other law schools. What, are the, what is the impact of that? Because now you, do you think you have to now establish more of a community, you know, make allies, make contacts? How do you see that as a next step to actually being a part of a law firm and, and making sub, real substantive change when it comes to diversity? Well. I'm a numbers person. You probably realize that. I saw it. I look at numbers. And so when I look at numbers, and I tell this to our own people here, to our affinity groups, affinity groups have two jobs. They do one of them really, really well, and they do the other one really, really poorly. 
The one that they do real well is that they bring you together within the cultural circle that you feel comfortable in. The one that they don't do so well is the fact that they, that the purpose of an affinity group is to integrate you with the larger group. And that one, it doesn't work real well because who gets invited to all these things is just those the Hispanic. Well, if you don't invite the other people, <laughs> you know, who are 80% of the law profit and have the bulk of the business, you're not gonna get anywhere. So my, you know, I think what Kappa does, I think what all these groups do is terrific. But the one thing that I would encourage you highly is not to segregate yourself from 80% of the lawyers who have a hell of a lot of business and would like to help you, but sometimes they feel pushed aside. I know it's strange for me to be saying, well, Leon, look, you know, that you're pushing away these people, et cetera. Nobody does it intentionally, but I am telling you, because I, I talk to all these folks, they're more concerned about us than we are about them. They, 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 they don't know necessarily how to talk to us. They don't know whether to call them Latino or Hispanic or to a black. And, and so what happens when they feel uncomfortable, they shy away. And then if we not only do they shy away, but we have an affinity group that doesn't really bring him in and make him part of it. So to me, the most important, you know, in, in, in a very weird way, when I graduated from law school, there were no affinity groups. So I had no choice. I had to go <laughs> and jump in the middle of the fray and just make friends and figure out how I was gonna do it. I didn't have anybody saying, come to this little meeting here and it would just be about us. And so I hope this doesn't come off the wrong way, but, but you cannot block out 80% of the lawyers who have a bulk of the business and think that you're gonna succeed equally. Uh, affinity groups can help you on, on, on cultural things, et cetera but you have to realize what the numbers are like and, and what is it that you need to focus on to do well. And let me tell you, because most people don't do that, if you as a Hispanic begin to reach out to that group and bring them together, et cetera, and you're together as a group, it's like easy picking uh, right now. I'm not suggesting this is all, you know, all easy, but you know, it's not like everybody's doing this. I mean, I'm trying to get people here at the firm to do that, to say, when we have a diversity, I, 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 I want the, the, the non-diverse people in, the, in those rooms, because if, if they're there and they get to know you and they like you and they understand how, how smart you are and all of that, their view of referring matters to you, giving you matters, having your work will change drastically. Yeah. And if not, you know, they'll, they'll give you marginal stuff and, and it's not going to be quite what it is. So again, that may be a little harsh, uh, but I, I'm a great believer in, in, in telling you the way, the way I see it, because otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm too old and I won't have a chance to try to convince you uh, again. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I, I agree with that. And I think that affinity groups, it's important to try to bring people together, um, you know, for Cava, for example, we do a lot with other organizations that are not Cuban American, plus a lot of our members aren't Cuban American and or Cuban. And, yes. and I think that that's important uh, because I think you're right. Like if you're just in your group and not really opening up to other ideas, to other people experience, to getting to know each other so you could do actually business together, which is the whole exactly. point, right? If we're not gonna do that together, then then why are, why are we here, you know, in this country to, and try to get, uh, a community that actually works together versus just being in our own little little world. Um, I think that's very important. And I think we're going to have time for one question and from the audience. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, give you the question from David Skip. And David Skip is asking, can you describe for us the discrimination that existed in the legal community when you first joined Greenberg Chorig? Has that changed in your opinion? Um, 
that has changed quite a bit, but not necessarily when when I joined Greenberg Torres, and I was a Hispanic lawyer. And remember, people forget this. <laughs> but when I got here to the United States, there were signs that said in apartments, no Negroes, no Cubans, no dogs. Okay. So it's not like we were, we were loved. And so when you see Miami today, and I tell you that there were signs like that, that people look at me like you're crazy. You know, that, that could never have been. Well, that, that. So it was very clear. I, I remember the first time I went to New York to do a corporate, I wanted to be a corporate and securities lawyer. And they finally sent me to New York to do a deal. And I was so happy I was gonna go. So of course, I understand that I better dress up to go to New York or use my best, whatever best I had. Unfortunately for the people in New York, I, I, I lived in Hialeah at the time. And, and so the, my, the Hialeah best was a little bit off Wall Street's best. So I showed up with with a shirt, Maria, that was exactly the color of the dress that you're wearing, red. A red shirt, a beige suit, uh, a, a tie that matched my belt and, and my shoes, and they were not necessarily black. They were, you know, a beige color, et cetera. But that was Hialeah at the time. And that's how I showed up in New York, in one of these big, big white shoe farms. So I still remember. I can still see the faces of the people, the snickering, the the, the laughter, the, the, the sort of pointing behind your back and basically saying, why is the guy who's supposed to bring us coffee, you know, in here with a briefcase? Um, and, and, and so it was a very, I laugh about it today, it's a very painful experience, but because of my parents. The next time I was there, I had a pinstripe suit, I had dotted tie, I had a white shirt, I had the uniform. Uh, and I realized what needed to be done. But you were not accepted in the legal community. We're not, you, you were not an equal. If you were at a meeting, they would try to ignore you in every way. The New York lawyers were the worst. They would try to embarrass you in front of your client. I mean, I can't tell you how many times that happened to me, um, et cetera. So that has shifted. And by the way, that was the same whether you were Cuban, you were a woman, or you were black. I mean, you you were in the same category. You were just, you did not belong there. And they told you and did everything they could to show you didn't belong there. Didn't take you into account, didn't participate, etc. Throughout the years, that has changed. And I, I think today, in most places, you will be accepted. Even in the ones that you're not accepted, they at least view you as a neutral. Meaning, let's see what she says. <laughs> let's see if she really can, can carry on the day here. And that's why I tell minority that when you go to a meeting, there's two things that you got to do. First of all, you can't say something stupid because if you say something stupid, <laughs> you, you're going to brand that way. You, but A, you got to say something, and you got to say something that is meaningful, because that you're changing the the uh, the branding that these people have that maybe you are not belong there will change when you would say something meaningful uh, and, and, and that meeting. And two, you got to speak up because if you don't speak up, they will assume that you were not capable of doing it. It is so much better now, so much better now. For women and uh, Hispanics, um, and, and I think it's just a, uh, a a wonderful change. We're not a hundred percent there. There still be some idiots that that you know that could create a problem. But my point to you, whenever you meet one of those, you have two choices. One is you let them win get yourself upset over it, let them take you off of your game. They win when they do that. They're not upset, you're upset, they're not upset. Or you decide, I'm winning the game. 
<laughs> I'm, you know, if he's an idiot and he thinks that, et cetera, et cetera, I'm going to stick to my game. I'm going to do what's right for the clients. I'm going to do better than, than he's going to do and move that way. Don't get sucked in into the battle as to whether, you know, he was not deferential to you or this, that, and the other. The more you ignore him, the worse it is for them. The more you react to the nonsense that sometimes they put you through, the happier they are. And so the choice is pretty simple in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I think that that's, that's good advice, especially with all the years of experience, you know, the things you've seen. Um, I, so I think we have to leave it there. We had so many more questions, Caesar, from, you know, the Q&A and, and other questions to ask you, but you're... We really appreciate all your insight today and, and the time you spent with us and to our audience for spending this hour with us. Um, so well, thank let, you. let me tell you what I will do. If any of those folks who needed to want to have a question, et cetera, if, if, if they were to email me at uh, CA direct at, at gtlaw.com. So it's CA like Cesar Alvarez uh, at uh, gtlaw.com. I will do my best to answer them or to or, or to call them and talk to them. Yeah, no, that's that's a great offer. Um, Jasmine, would you like to say anything else before we go? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much to everybody, Caesar. Again, thank you for your time, and thanks to Maria Carla and Dean Page, and everybody at Cawa and all the and FIU Law. We truly appreciate this. And Casa Cuba, have a great afternoon and be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Bye. Thank you so much.